answer the, this question. And I'll give you an example. So when my when I went to Nigeria back in 2015, um, my sister was uh, was diagnosed with cancer, and I went in on the day that she was being diagnosed. And I was asking the the doctor many many questions, and she looked at me in a very strange way, as if why are you asking me? And I'm like, well, I'm sorry, I need to know. Uh, because, you know, this, this is the kind of thing that we do back where I'm coming from. Right. Uh, she didn't like that. So it's education both ways. The, the, the doctors and the nurses, the, the practitioners, and also individuals to be able to ask the right questions. And then challenge government and bring them to a place where they do end up having that political will to change things for the better. So for me, where do we start? It's good that the professor is doing something about it right. uh, and taking people, hopefully, to Nigeria to kind of show them. It's more like show and tell. You show people how things should be done and hopefully that will rub off on them and they would learn from that. But the problem with that is um, it's only going to be a drop in the ocean unless we get galvanized people to kind of do more of that in every community. So this is where this platform is quite helpful to be able to put out there that word uh, for people to say, look, you know, I can do this, I can do that. So the challenge is now for all of us in the diaspora, plus our brothers and sisters back home to work together, you know, to actually not wait for government because right. they, they do have a huge part to play, but don't, don't let's wait for them. We've waited for too long and they've disappointed us. And I can't see that changing soon. So right. that's my take. Thank you. Awesome, Sandra. I, I mean, I, I think we have looked at, we've set a tone now. So we've heard from Doc, uh, we've heard from Prof, and obviously Sandra has uh, given us, uh, from a casual bystander's point of view, she's seen both issues and, and highlighted it. Let, if we move on to a slightly uh, uh, situation now where we say, okay, now that we know those key things, uh, from a diaspora point, diaspora point of view, what kind of uh, resources and initiatives? This is open for everybody. Now, if you, if you have one or two, because this is where we unlock value, uh, what kind of uh, initiatives can we actually come up with to assist our education and our health sector to improve both, since we're focused on these two sectors? Um, obviously, we know um, um, Prof is doing uh, some excellent stuff. Um, the key thing, his university is online, um, Sandra. Uh, what he's doing, his initiative is online. Um, so on the physical stuff, you might not necessarily be going there, but it's creating a space where people can go and unlock value. So please, if, if there are other people in here who know or have one or two key uh, initiatives that you think we can kick off, um, Abby, you can set the tone for that. Say, look, this is one or two initiatives that we think we should start doing or think we should start talking about. And who knows, one or two in here might unlock that going forward. So from your point of view, Abby, uh, do, do you have one or a few initiatives that we can um, experience with you? Oh, good evening all. Um, I think um, going off from where um, the last speaker left off is about, for me, it's about educating the public, the people who are actually in receipt of healthcare. Because for, for us who work here, we know I, I have to be very careful when I approach a, a patient with the medication. He or she's going to ask me what the medication is for, what we expect, and why should they take it? So the same way, I think maybe one initiative would be, I don't know, mm. for maybe an organization to go about and educate public, um, the community in Nigeria about different health issues. I'm sure there are people doing that already. What to expect, what kind of treatment to take, and what kind of questions to ask their health professionals. But having said that, can they afford the right medication is the question. Somebody touched on a traditional education. And so I think the same person talked about uh, traditional medicine. We cannot separate um, traditional medicine from Western medicine in Nigeria. They go hand in hand. People need to be confident about what healthcare they're receiving. They will not stop using Agbo if it works. Of course, they will use it. But then if they need to take antibiotics that are expensive, they're not going to use those because they cannot afford it. So again, it's about maybe an organization going out there to educate people about symptoms of conditions, what to expect, how to treat it. And then that should go hand in hand with, again, government initiatives. 
without a, a political will to have to maintain a healthy population, none of this will happen. So you can they all go hand in hand together. The government, the people, and those actually in receipt of um, health care. Awesome, Abby. Thanks, Abby. Um, cheers for that. Um, just to, 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 to buttress what she has said, yes, we, we, we truly align with that, right? But these initiatives, uh, if we don't converse about them and bring them to light, we're under the impression that one or two people might miss a trick. And this is why we have all these collaborations going left, right, center. Uh, from an educational point of view, now, um, uh, Mr. Chris is an educator here. We are looking at packages that we can say, hey, look, from an educational point of view, what kind of things can we package together and use as initiatives to help our health sector? Uh, we are out here, we're seeing all these beautiful things and amazing things. Are there packages that we can come up with or you know, in existence that we can amplify? Um, Chris Uchena, I know you are an educator. Before I go to Doc, um, Doc has one or two. But Chris, if you can just give us a, one or two nuggets from what you, from your experiences, from an educational point of view. Is that a package that you think is, is there? And a few other people might have a few. From the basics, we need a very long and in-depth structural change in terms of our curriculum. Uh, the problem, someone said earlier on that um, we're running a foreign system, we've not been able to develop our own curriculum with regards to the needs of the country. And that, that is where the fundamental problem comes from. I, I know most of you may have gone, we've gone to the universities in Nigeria, and you know that the curriculum we've been running all along from, even from the early 70s, I see most of the curriculum that are still in place. So we've not been able to restructure our curriculum based on the needs of the country. We have basically nothing with regards to our research initiative. Nigerians that currently our research system have nothing to talk about. I did make, we did make some, with a, a couple of friends some years back and we're talking about how, how we can intervene in terms of education in Nigeria. Right. Some of the issues we discovered are purely issues that most of our I'm not trying to pull anyone down, but we discovered that most of the people that are in charge of education in Nigeria, um, actually, they don't have the basic or concurrent knowledge with regards to educational needs that can compare with what is happening in the Western world. Okay. And where do you start from? You start from the training. You start from where do you start from? Yeah. I, I'm telling you this, that one of the things that I did when I went back into politics years back in the, in the early the 1990s and 2000. One of the things I did was to go back and do a personal research on educational system. What I did was to visit about all two, three, five local government within my territory, within the capital territory. And I went and have interventions and discussions with the heads of education. And I look at infrastructure. And I went, it took me nearly about three, four months. And I discovered that the basic infrastructures are completely lacking. They have nothing. The teachers have nothing in terms of knowledge and education or what they need there to do. Right. And I wrote a report, a comprehensive result report that I submitted to the governor of my state then. And we did agree that there should be some interventions or else the education system will continue to die. Unfortunately, the governor hasn't got the will to continue with that research, with that, with that report, and it died. And what I discovered was that the system where we have our structure, the structure of the school systems are completely obsolete. And there's nothing you can do just like not laying a foundation. And right. how do you start, how do you start building without a foundation? And some things I think we can do, I, I tried, a couple of years ago on how we can intervene is that we need to find a system where the diaspora can have a voice. Unfortunately, we do not have a voice because those back home, those politicians do not regard us as anything because okay. they believe they believe is is theirs for the taking. Uh, um, and one of the things that I will recommend that we yeah. should be able to look at how Nigerian structure in terms of curriculum should be rewritten with the okay. 
sickness or what the country requires. And that's why our youths are not employable when they finish education. All right, let, let me jump in quickly because I, I think I unlocked a key value from you that I think uh, resonates with everybody because you shared the key thing that we have already touched on. We, we know what's crumbling. We know exactly where we're failing. And don't get me wrong, for the last six weeks, everybody in here has been coming in. Oh, we've had that rant, right? The, the truth of the matter is you just said something that is key. You said we need to have a diasporic voice, you know, that can actually empower things. That is an initiative. You know, that's what we're trying to unlock, those kind of values. Because I might know that, but a few other people might not know it, right? So in terms of having that voice now, okay, we take that voice and we go back home. How do we amplify that voice? This is where our politicians come into place, right? So I've got a few people in here who can give us an, another uh, insight from what you just said, picking up from what you said. How do we now amplify that value? You know, before we go into someone else to unlock another kind of value, how do we amplify that particular value of, uh, from a diasporic point of view? Um, I know Doc has a question, but Doc, one minute, if um, also can, can help us with that one from a political point of view, you know, for the sake of time. Hey, look, the, the health sector needs help. Uh, the diasporic voice needs to be, to be heard, which is loud, but it drops down to the country now. How do politicians run away with that and how can you amplify it for us? Well, I, well, I think um, the diaspora has to be strategic. Um, if you are not bringing in money, because um, that would be the easiest thing. If you have your own money, you can come in and create pools of excellence. Um, but what, what, a lot of, what, what a lot of politicians, or the, the best time to get at a polit to a politician is during elections. So for instance, now, um, a lot of you would have been seeing the shenanigans playing out in Edo State. Um, we have a governorship election coming up. The best time to negotiate with a, with a politician is just before their elections. That if there was, it right, though, it? sorry, no, I just said that doesn't make it right though, because the, the, the no, it's it's it's, it's 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 unfortunately it's human nature. Um, if you can offer them value, you can use that to negotiate for deals. You know, if you win, then you know you you will have to sign up. It's almost like a lobby. I'm, I'm sort of like describing a lobby. You know. We will support you if you sign off to taking up um, these proposals. What we would then have to do then is have our policy documents ready, have our proposals, have our briefs ready that the governors or politicians or whoever can sign off to. And um, then the voice would be able to you know, lobby or campaign or endorse the government and adds to the success of that politician's electoral victory. That's the easiest way to get it done if you want politicians to get involved. After they win, um, it's very, very hard to get them to, to listen to you. Um, I, I'm just going to ask a lady here, um, Miss uh, Sumi, if, if you agree with us uh, on that level, because I, I don't think we need to wait on politicians. Uh, I think we can come up with strategies. Um, you, you highlighted that we need a strategy, and I totally agree. Uh, we've been working on a few strategic um, uh, initiatives. Um, Doc here um, uh, with, the, with the African University, which is a great initiative, um, but still, um, it, it seems there's still a blocker between our, our learning and our delivery. Um, Ms. Uh, uh, Sami, I know you, you work in the health yeah. sector as well. Do you think we lack strategy, or do you have an initiative that you think we are not even exploring, and, and then we can unlock that value from there? And then we can go to Doc's question. Doc, you can, you can pick up with Sami after that, please. Okay, um, I believe that basically where we need to start is reorientation of our minds. And this goes way down to the, to the smallest of the, of the smallest of us. It's not just about having the infrastructure. It's right. not just about the education. It's the basic mindset that we have in Nigeria. And for some reason, it keeps getting worse. Um, I mean, Okay, somebody just brought up this point about negotiating with a politician before the election. I can tell you from experience that it doesn't work. They will agree to anything you want. They, they may even sign anything you want, but after the election, you, you, you just can't predict. The thing is, what I'm trying to say is we need to reorient our minds. Okay put the society, to put the needs of others, especially those who are um, 
less privileged, we yeah. need to put their needs ahead of the needs of the many need to trump the needs of the one. I believe that we need to have a reorientation before right. anything can work. You can have all the infrastructure you want, and if you don't have the right, mind, right mindset, right. it's just not going to work. Doc? Um, no, actually, not a question. I'm just trying to make two quick contributions because you asked the question. You said, can we put together um, a package that no matter how small, can make a difference either in the education sector or in the health sector right. and um, I mean we can um, even if even if it's uh, a few people at a time I think that we can put together packages and start to educate people at primary school level um, in, in when we were young we had um, subjects that covered healthcare, you know, physical health education or whatever it was called at the time. If we put packages in place that can be introduced, it, you know, even if it's just for a few weeks, a year, every year, for example, teaching children uh, basic resuscitation, teaching children how to identify when they themselves or other people are in distress and how to call for help. And as they get older, start to teach them how to carry out very basic first aid, you know, the kind of things that you learn in Boy Scout or Girls Guide. Right. Um, people learned a lot more from Boy Scout and Girls Guide than they learned at school when it comes to things that you, you start to teach these children from a very young age. Some of these children will be receivers of healthcare as they grow up. Some of them will grow up to become providers of healthcare. So that's from the educational end of things. Because it's difficult, to, it's much easier to start to make a systemic change, a culture shift when you start at that level. So if there's a package that teaches first aid, for example, um, at primary school level, to, you know, every child is, even if it's just a few schools, but every child in those schools will be required to attend a few hours every year of these basic things, how to resuscitate somebody who's not breathing, how to deal with somebody who swallowed something, right. how to deal with fires. And then you teach that every year, just a refresher course, just like you do in any industry. That's on the education. And then in terms of professionals, we can also put together packages. And the reason I say this is because I've been part of something similar where we go and train the healthcare providers. Um, please don't make that a secret if you, if you don't mind. No, no, I, okay. Tell that at some point. Yeah. You know, yeah. We, I am part of a group that goes back to Nigeria almost every year and we try and train healthcare professionals, train them as much as we can get facilities, leave facilities behind, leave medication behind. So your update, and we've, what we found is that even the healthcare professionals are lacking in their knowledge of healthcare delivery. So you find people still doing things the traditional way rather than the medical way. You know, just a quick example, I just, you know, newborn baby, people still slap the baby's back, slap the baby's more uh, bomb, and rub medical spirit just to try and make the baby cry. Yes, people did that traditionally, but there's really no scientific value in it. And you know, you're probably gonna end up killing the baby or letting the baby die rather, rather than killing the baby. So it's about educating the healthcare professionals to say, actually, these things that we're doing are right. no longer relevant in the modern medical space. Okay, let me cut you a shot there, Doc, right. because th you said something that from last week, um, Sandra said a key thing that there are some people that you might have children who their parents might be choking and they wouldn't know what to do. Yeah. So it, go it goes back to that basic education. Now you have a few packages, right? And you said that hey, you're already working on packages. This is what we are about. We're trying to align with those, those kind of thinking, especially within this subject. Now, the, the thing we'll probably put forward to you where someone can, can, can uh, highlight and it, probably Doc and, uh, and Jide can talk about it, is if we have those packages ready, right? That's one. Can we now start thinking about making specific packages forever and sharing it on a platform where it's tailored specifically for specific age groups in Nigeria? To say, for instance, in primary school, we can make packages here. It's easy to say, this is how you save someone when they're choking, right? Are we in a position to have doctors that we appreciate that kind of value? I mean, uh, Monica can highlight on that. Uh, if, 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 would that. Is that something that you think that is, it can be appreciated? If you have these videos and short courses to help people learn and educate on the, uh, on the medical side of things, how would that amplify your own uh, uh, being as a doctor? And then, you know, a few other people can chip in or 
just based on what, how they feel. Okay, first of all, uh, I would just like to uh, remind us that um, a large percentage of people that um, are online, you know, are, uh, sorry, are not online, are in the villages. And that's where we have the major population in Nigeria. About 75% of people are in the villages and, the, and the rural areas. And these are people that actually need a lot of uh, education that we're talking about. Now, what I think that can be done, yes, on the primary school level, something can be done, but not just um, visual packages. I'm thinking of something more physical. Right. If, yes, like uh, if, uh, I know it's going to be hard to uh, put something like this in the educational system already, but if volunteers for whatever uh, way can go school by school to have, you know, a lecture or just a short discussion, you know, about saving lives, and that, that's, that's, that's very cool. But what I want to really emphasize on, in the university level, like you have the general studies um, course, they call GST, where people talk about all types of, you know, it's a, very, it's a compulsory course in a hundred level, and it cuts across different sections of, of life. Unfortunately, health is missing from that subject. And that subject, I think entrepreneur and others are also have been introduced, but nothing about health. But if the health, you know, if health is introduced to GST, in the university level, I think it would go a long way. Where people are taught how to resuscitate someone if someone collapsed, how to save someone from drowning, you know, basic things that can save a person's life. You know, because in primary school, yeah, it's good, but sometimes if a child knows what to do, an adult can easily bully the child, my friend, get out from here, you know, what do you think you're doing? But someone in the, in the, in the tertiary level, you know, when the person says, oh, I can do this, I've been taught in school, you know, I've seen diagrams or, you know, or pictures of how, what, what you can do when someone collapses. I think that can go a very, very long way. Then very secondly, cool. education of, um, the, of, of um, healthcare workers in the primary healthcare sent, you know, facilities, it, it will go a long way because most of these people, trust me, they're not even educated. Recently, that Delta State, they closed down a hospital that uh, was admitting just three students, you know, just teenagers as nurses. You know, this was terrible. Yes, just three, you know, in their fourteens or, or you know, as or sixteens as nurses, night nurses, day nurses, and they were, you know, they were told that they were in a training. I'm like, this is this is ridiculous. So right. what I'm saying that those already professionals in the healthcare system, especially right. the primary healthcare system, they should be strengthened enough to know what to do. But most of them, trust me, like they don't know what they're doing. Honestly, they really don't know what they're doing. Fine, it's cool to yeah to 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 train all the professionals that you know that are on top. But we should look at those at the bottom because those are the ones that are in the grassroots. Those are right. the ones that are in the communities that actually need this, you know, um, healthcare urgently. Um, at the moment, on this platform, um, from what I've observed in the last 50 minutes, we've got people on this platform who are already initiating things on the ground. Now, how do we online connect to this? How do we assist? How do we all tap in and become one big family? Because unless we are one big family, my yeah. personal opinion, I don't think we'll move forward. I, I think you. you read my mind there, David, to be honest. Thank you very much. You really read my mind because I'm going to go, okay, she has highlighted, we've heard from um, the, the doctors who are really, really struggling and then we heard from educators as well and then people in the middle. But let's go back to uh, our people who are active in politics. Um, I, I had a chat with Amolelu uh, uh, with you and she, she hinted on something that we have been talking about for the last three weeks as well, that is orientation. So just based on what we've discussed here now, um, Sony highlighted that, uh, highlighted in that as well, and I know um, Sandra has talked about it, we need the proper orientation. But if we have the orienta orientation, I'm a little, how, can we, how can you guys help us activate that orientation, or rather amplify it? So I'm a little, I don't know if you have one or two minutes to help us uh, just discuss on that orientation. First of all, I apologize for um, coming in late. And I think I had bits and pieces of the conversation. And but what I keep hearing is government, 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 and I'm, I'm putting together packages. We've been doing, putting together packages for many years now. We, um, I wrote the UB program for uh, Zanfra State. They used it. They asked me if they could send it to the federal. They did. Um, it was never an interest of being recognized for it or being 
uh, paid for it or involved in it, but wanting to make sure that the right things and the right processes are in place. And that's where we can bring progress to our people. Um, the issues we're having is because we need to be recognized by government. I disagree. I have a foundation and I've told you before, and I'm not a doctor, um, but three of us were tired of seeing the way our people were treated in the healthcare uh, system, um, the lack of training of professionals, having lived out of this country for at least 30 years and seeing the way things are done in other countries. I think that when we come here, we should tailor those things to fit our people. You know, the politicians we're talking of are products of our communities. We raise them. They're not strangers. They're not from other countries. And what we're saying is that um, when, uh, for instance, again, going back to what our foundation is doing, what we did, we now got the best. Uh, he's a consultant. He's fantastic. He actually saved my life. And that's the reason why we brought him in. Um, when we, 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 we had patients coming in from specialist hospital and UBTH for us to just say, this is ridiculous. We, even when we need to treat or do have surgeries done, we don't have any facilities to have it done. So I just told him, I said, look, let's stop wasting our time with government and all of this stuff. Go and build a hospital that we can service our people in our area. An area will be for paying people who have money and the other area will be for, for the foundation where poor people can come in and have free health care. We need continuing education, continuing education, continuing education. We cannot stop getting educated in any sector of our lives. Doctors need to be trained and retrained. Um, nurses need to be trained and retrained and retrained and taught new things. That's why they have medical conferences in other countries where new ideas come in, when new technology comes in, they call them, they, you pay for those conferences, you go there, you learn new ideas, you learn new techniques, you learn how to new, use the new equipment that has been brought in. So all this, you know, we need to put together a package. We need, just do it. If you want to help your people, the only way that this is going to happen right. is that you come together and then you decide exactly what your target group is and work to it and have government join you. We have applications, medical applications that can record all of the, the illnesses even for the COVID and all that, we have all those things. We've talked to government, we've talked to everybody. Nobody is listening. Yeah. Professor Gamme, who, has a, who is the only Nigerian that has a licensed university in the USA, came to Nigeria more than six years ago or so, about, I think around 2010, and engaged the government that we should have online um, classes and it, it, it's already designed, they refuse, and COVID hits and they are stuck. And, well, and my children, my, my adopted children here are having to go to school on WhatsApp. I'm, and the, the, the teachers are, are sending work and asking me to grade it. I, I don't get that. So in, in other words, we, we don't get, we, we, we have all the facilities to move forward. We refuse to move forward. That's our problem. We have the money. <laughs> what is stopping us? There is nothing, to be honest. Um, exactly what the problem is what is stopping us nothing nothing is stopping us but we're not talking about this thing enough i don't think we're conversing enough and that's why we have these platforms right um a, a week ago uh, a professor suggested that we have these pockets and amplify it all right um ga is uh is a reverend here and we work together with a, a group called africa where we work with children and uh you know we try to make sure they're educated and make sure they're getting the value they they they, they, they deserve right now where we are failing is we are not amplifying what we're doing in the diaspora i think uh, we are not packaging it enough or, or rather putting it in place to send it back home um yes you're right i'm gonna do we we do need uh, uh to build things and build stuff uh, but we also need that orientation we need them to learn the whole point is we think learning is missing. And I think Julia had a point with you in terms of, okay, fair enough. If this learning is not there, and how do we now package ourselves to give value? I think this is what we are really about individually. How do we now enhance our own value? Maybe I can tell you what we do, what my the group and part of what we do or what they do. Maybe that would help. Yes, please. It's, it's um, I pick up from what Monica Sorry about that, Julia. Um, oh, so sorry. No, no, it's all right. You got what did it did it was uh, going to give us something, but it's fair enough. I'll pick up for what Monica said about going from school to school and primary health care providers. What we do, whatever state we're going to beforehand, we liaise with the state and make sure that the state provides 
people from every local government area, primary health care level, and they all come to the state capital for the three days or four days these training programs are on. Uh, and then we provide the training, because it's about training people who are providing health care and also training the trainer. If you train one person, they go back and train other people, especially if you give them facilities that are adapted for our environment. There's no point training somebody how to use a, use a resuscitation machine to resuscitate a newborn when they don't have one in their village. It's, you're better off teaching them techniques that can work, that do not re require electricity or diesel or generator. So, and I think that can also be done for schools. Rather than trying to go to all schools, maybe we can create a platform where people volunteer. It's going to cost money, and I'm sure some it of us are matter, have but with the thing is if we don't know, we don't know. Yeah, we get, teachers, we get teachers from as many schools, from as many local government areas to come down for the day. Sometimes we actually provide funds for these people who come in, pay them, uh, because you need, we are desperate to deliver this service. So if, if we can get teachers to come in for X number of days and then train them on what to teach their children, you can actually spread that information from one point to the, an entire state faster than trying to go from primary school to primary school, class to class. Okay, can I follow you up on that? Because obviously I, I've known you for a while, but I had no clue about what you're doing. Um, I, I grew up in basically in a hospital, right? So my passion is deep on that level, right? Um, what you're doing, like I said, I had no clue, but I, I would really like to follow you up on that. And if there's anybody who would like to, you know, understand more of what uh, um, uh, Doc is saying or, or, you know, get involved, this would be a good idea to bring that collaboration together. Essentially, our call is to converse collaborate and unlock value, right? Uh, we don't want to spend the whole day just, just arguing about stuff or shouting. Let's see where the value is because we're all taking notes and unlocking it and then the collaboration happens, right? Uh, uh, GD, uh, the reason why I highlighted GD because he, he works on the physical side and on the, on, the, on the spiritual side as well, being a reverend. That value that we're looking for, GD, right? If you've got one or two minutes to align with, with, with all, what Omalulu said and what Doc is saying, that value I'm not, I'm not, we're saying, I'm not going to talk about religion. I think no, 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 no. I'm just, I'm just trying. <laughs> that's fine. But that value we're trying to key, right? Can you please tell yeah. us exactly why you, I mean, can you just give us a heads up uh, on stuff that you're already doing, I know you're doing, and then align that with the need for, for that orientation to, to be amplified? Well, I think that one of the areas is actually patient's voice. I think patient's voice is very important. There are many communities in Nigeria that obviously do not have a voice on their own medical cares or medical needs. And I think that medical communities need to be listening to what the people are saying. Now, of course, I mean, sexual health, particularly HIV, is one of those areas where people are so afraid, you know, to go into the clinics. Or, and because they go there and the doctors and nurses and everyone else will be preaching to them about behaviors rather than focus on the treatment. So there are issues in those areas and things like that need to change. And you can then imagine we can take that into other areas of medical needs as well. We've talked about the medical care of children, people in the rural area, you know, and I'm really glad that someone had the statistics about population because if 75% of Nigerians are not in the city, where do they go for the medical health and their needs? Those are the questions we should be looking at. Now, one thing that I know for sure is that there are organizations, right. whether it be in Nigeria or in the diaspora, that actually has a process, a manual, of educating people on what to do. Let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's look for these organizations. We, there are many of them in South Africa, in East Africa, that we can go and look at what they're doing in terms of empowering citizens on their medical needs. I mean, they, our constitution actually says that everyone uh, has a human right for the highest standard of health care. That's what we should be looking at. You know, if you look at the rate of people dying in hospital, these days. This is not really about COVID alone. It's about okay. many. I mean, Nigeria has one of the highest numbers of well trained medical practitioners. There are avoidable death, you know, that, that we can have in Nigeria. Right. But the real, real essence is education. And we can always go back to that education. We can do it at local level, uh, community level, and indeed at national level. I know you're already doing that. Trust me, I know you're already doing that, and and that needs to be amplified. Thanks a lot for that, Jide. But the key value I got from there that probably you might agree with. Yeah, with I knew Malulu had a had a, had a uh, question as well, and I think uh, Bube me as well. But the thing is, you just said something that we've probably not discussed before, which is patient's voice. You see, to me, that's really key. 
uh, they, they, they could be an existing repository of patients' concern. You know, it's a package that can actually help. It can help provoke the government to do something. Um, do you have a take on that um, from a patient's voice point, point? Sorry, patient's voice point of view, being an initiative that you think would help. Uh, this one is for Malilu and probably for Bugami to align with her and patient's voice because that's a new value that I think we've just unlocked here and it's got me going on a level. Um, I agree uh, that the patients have rights and um, just a couple of days ago there was a write-up that went out uh, which was very political that was talking about the health status of one of the contestants or the candidates. I was very angry about that. And I feel that there should be patient doctor um, confidentiality, so that there should be in law or any other field for where patient has a right to privacy. Um, a lot of times patients don't have any rights in Nigeria. Um, they are treated very badly. I've observed situations where patients have been beaten up because they didn't have the funds um, to pay for their medical bill. Um, they, in fact, uh, when you're talking about training, um, bringing people or gathering people to a place, where they know nothing or they've never been. Um, it may be exciting for a minute, but what we're missing here is that we should go to the rural areas and train them, study the environment that they live in and um, find ways to accommodate the healthcare to suit the people there. Now, you know, so we keep going to other countries uh, to go and get information. What we need to do is to start listening to our people and believing in them. We, we seem to have very low self-esteem about the way we do things. Um, we always think that somebody else's idea is better than, uh, and, uh, uh, than ours. The truth of the matter is that Nigerians are the best all over the world except in Nigeria. I think we need to recognize ourselves that we know what to do and that we should start doing the right things. Awesome. Um, um, me, um, in alignment with that, right, just following up, right, still on patient's voice. I, I, I mean, if we have a repository, for instance, uh, we know um, Osari is building a university now, so you can imagine a situation where you have a list of uh, patients complain and using that to create some kind of orientation. Uh, in alignment with that, Bugami, um, from your point of view, uh, do you think that needs to be amplified or do you think there's another thing we can create on top of that in terms of enhancing patient's voice and then we can go back to, uh, uh, to Sandra and then jump to, uh, to Bola, who uh, I know is on the call. Um, okay. Everyone has been speaking well. I'm just going to uh, mention two things. Um, so me and I think um, so Omodio mentioned something about orientation right. or a reorientation. Apart from doing infrastructural development in rules, let's start a reorientation of from primary one. Because a lot of times from secondary schools, a lot of these minds have already been made up. Let's understand that when we grew up, most of us here, our, our kids, our folks were really involved in our upbringing per se. When they had jobs, they were doing and all that because it was such a system that most people didn't have to more or less go out to do extra hustles to make ends meet, to just even provide the basic amenities. Now, parents have to do so, so much. By the time they get home, they are tired. So more, more often than not, it's the educational system that is raising our kids. You understand? And even in raising these kids with what the educational system is. You know, someone said something about the university, you know, that I'm not being, being able to, you know, changing curriculum. Yes, I agree with that. In that, while we are changing curriculum, let's also understand some about our educational system in the universities. It doesn't just give educational knowledge. It gives a whole set of orientation that, like, it's more or less preparing you for the world, to meet the world. Apart from technical courses like um, engineering, medicine, and the rest, is the interactions that prepares you to take on jobs. A lot of us are doing jobs that what we learned in school, we, did, we are not applying them. So it's the orientation of the, the interaction of the university with people, with processes, having to study on your own, the independence. It's just preparing you to face the world. Then the last thing I'm going to talk about is accountability. You see, everything the diaspora is doing to intervene to help old students association and all that, to help with their old school, their alma mater, their communities are good. But here's the challenge. As far as government knows that there are people who will be willing to do things, they the fact that there's funding for it in the budget, the money keeps getting missing. We can keep doing everything we are doing, but we need to start to begin to, to, begin to hold government accountable, okay. one way or the other. We can't say, yes, we're going to provide uh, basic healthcare amenities for communities. It is good. We are going to train them. It is good. But meant to be funding for this thing. So individuals are basically playing the role of men. Of course. 
I mean, so all the monies are they just using it to amass for political favors and, and moving on? Let me let me let me just stop you quickly because um, the the truth of the matter is those those topics we have sat on it and battled it big time. We already know that the whole thing is you know, falling apart, but now we are unlocking the particular value that we all possess. So you bring out your own value to say, you know, hey, look, okay, this is what I think we should be doing based on what is already on ground or what is already being planned, just like Doc said, and then I know, I know what Sandra is doing and I know what uh, Prof is doing and what Jida is doing. Um, everything is happening in silos, you know? So you come here and you're surprised that, oh yeah, this guy is doing something fantastic in diaspora, some other person is doing something fantastic, but we don't have this collective effort to come together and either amplify it or sit on it. You know, I, I think you agree with me, Sandra, like for instance, I know you were doing a lot with a lot of charities, but I can count how many people know about, you know, what, what Sandra is, is doing. We don't know that, you know, so that failure there within uh, our learning, that the knowing and doing gap is what we're trying to see. How can we unlock value within there? Yeah. Um, thanks, Solomon. Sure. And, and sorry, I dipped out to this um, because my network was messing about. Um, but I think, I think this is really wonderful. I, I feel quite uh, encouraged by uh, this platform and what we've been doing the past few weeks. Uh, because as you said, there are quite a lot of us out there who are already doing stuff. There are lots of us out there who want to do stuff, but don't know where to start or don't know how to go about it. So this is a platform that would really help um, to bring everyone together and together we can actually do it, but we can't do it by ourselves. Our brothers and sisters back home, um, we're not gonna be dictating to them. We're going to go and help them and not do it for them. So and a lot of the things that people have talked about today uh, and people like to use the word orientation I think I would, I would rather say, I think the orientation is there. It's just that it hasn't been switched on. So we can help them to switch that on. So that, that, that's hopefully what we can do in the diaspora. That's what we are pushing and driving. Uh, for the last six weeks now, we, we, we've had uh, subject matters that have, you know, taken us two, three weeks to decipher. And we've unlocked a lot of value because I can categorically tell you that from day one and day two, we, we've successfully aligned people together and their initiatives that have already started in the background, you know, and they're already getting rolled out. Um, it, it, it's not a commercial platform where we say, oh yeah, how much is this going to cost or blah, blah. No, it's the case of we unlock our individual values. We share it because we care. It's centered around empathy. Um, just for the sake of time again, we barely have about three, four, five minutes. I think uh, if, if it's okay for you to Let's switch the narrative now to the end bit to say, okay, what are the best practices or initiatives that we can actually amplify? Everybody has a go on that because, you know, we're about 12 years. If everybody takes a minute or two to just say, hey, look, from your point of view, best practices that you think we can amplify that would aid the learning that would enhance our education, sorry, the learnings that would enhance our health sector in Nigeria. Uh, best practices, Benga. Right? Yeah. From what everybody has said, they've made valid contribution, especially from Dr. Aleto and Omar, Omar Ridon. Um, and I will not mention the, um, the challenges of no equipment or whatever that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Going straight to the point, best practice for me is we look at different health sectors that we have. It could be um, me mental health, mental health, um, dentist, uh, optician, eyes, whatever health sector that we have. We can speak with the, uh, we can try to negotiate with the government to have it because we need the policy, we need the government policy to be able to transfer the skills from the diaspora to people back home. Even simple things like just trying to have a Zoom call, have a website, have information given to, given to them on basic things that they can stop doing. Like even for eating disorder, obesity, and all those kind of minor illness, right. can help it was for the government and you know it can it can help individuals getting in involved into complicated um, issue issue with health because we know about prevention is better than cure. So best practice is we keep transferring more knowledge to them on any level, small level, any kind of health sector, and you know we get a better outcome. Awesome, thank you. And um, please, guys, if you have any other thing, just just put it in the chat and we'll unlock it as we go around. So I'll just start from the top, you know, just so everybody has a say on these best practices because that's where the value is. We've talked about stuff, all right? So I'll uh, start, Abby. Um, from your point of view, I, I, I know you're, you're keen on this as well. So your own best practice in terms of, oh, you know what? These are initiatives we can amplify or initiatives we're already working on. 
I, I posted something earlier about having a register of initiatives that already exist. Yeah, I and that. like Amololu said previously, that uh, we don't need to reinvent the wheels. If we've got them, they should use it to look at. And the other thing I just want to mention is not because the NHS is perfect, but I think we should consider the fact that many of our people back home cannot afford good lives. Yes, the food is there, but can they, can they afford the food? So maybe, again, going to health, if they can access a um, health service that is free at the point of delivery, then maybe that is something we need to consider. We don't need to copy the NHS, maybe adapt it to local needs. Just my point. I, it's I, not perfect. I that's excellent. If, if you can drop the, the drop that as well in the chat, that's really cool because I really want to do something with that, that adaptation to local needs. Uh, Doc, best practice, please, if you don't mind, just to give us value before we go. Um, I think uh, we're going back to something you said much earlier, professionalism. Um, I made a note of that. Awesome. I think that only comes from having regulations, checks and balances. Um, nobody you know, is professional unless it knows there are consequences to not being professional. So until we have systems in place that will check and balance and regulate how people do things, then people are going to do things however they like. So professionalism comes from regulatory bodies, end of. So you're saying we, we need to be tight on that on those regulations, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Thank there you. Should, um, there should be consequences when people practice uh, poorly. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Chris, uh, if you can, one minute, because we, we barely have time, just let us know from your point of view, based on all you've done, and we'll continue this again next week, uh, best practices that you think would aid uh, or create an impact uh, uh, for us in our educational system. Sorry, our health system from an uh, educational point of view. Yeah, I, I think just as um, we have said about um, about education and um, one thing that I think we, we need to, want to do as, 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 Ni as Nigerians in diaspora who want to bring change to our, our country back home. Um, just as uh, the, the doc adjusted about professionalism, thing that we need to do is how we can engage Nigerians and make them understand the essence of professionalism in terms of education, understanding what we need to do at the, at, as, as, as the basis and the foundation of which, how we can make positive interventions to make our education system work. As at this moment, it's not working. And, and I just said about I understand from the system, and I've been in that system in Nigeria, we don't have a uniform curriculum. Yes, we have a national curriculum, but it's not working because most of the private run a different curriculum, which is different from the national curriculum. And unless we have, have a unified system, it's going to have to continue to be the way it has been all along. We don't have a unified system. The private sectors, in terms of education, and they are they'll constitute almost about more than 50% now, they run a different curriculum. So we need to unify the system and yeah. then we take it from there. Okay, we kind of uh, lost you there, but thank you very much, Chris. I got two values from you there, which is um, enhancement of our engagement. Uh, trust me, that's exactly what this platform is for. And if you, if you read about what it is, it, it's just to enhance engagements. That, because there's a lot of value there. And you've said that, so that resonates with what we're doing. And then unification of the system. Um, on the technical side of things, I know exactly where you're coming from, you know, and that is being worked, and I can tell you already on so many facets, but that needs to be amplified. Uh, Mr. Ui, uh, in terms of uh, best practice, please, um, uh, you got a minute, really. So, hey, well, what is your take from our, yeah, our um, another point of view to the health point of view? Yeah, I think the, the point I was going to make was um, made by Omar Odeo, Dr. Omar Odeo. Okay. Yeah. So, Honestly, yeah. Great. Okay, no problem. Uh, we'll go back to you, Omolele, please, if you are, uh, because we're doing a round robin on everybody. So it's come back to you. Best practice, yeah, um, before we go, so, so we can all put a smile on our faces. Well, I, I, I wish we would stop hitting our heads on the wall as regards uh, Nigeria. Um, we definitely need to um, meet the people at their point of need. It's very important that we do that. Um, it, it's very difficult. You know, I've been here for a while and, and I've seen the hang-ups having to deal with politicians and, and government in trying to get um, the right policies through. But one thing I've discovered that once you start it and they can see where you're going with it, they're willing to go along with you. But as long as you're showing them 
and paperwork and talking. It's just talk and it's just paper. Um, so we'll have to make the effort and we have to make sacrifices to make all of this happen. And like I said before, we do need social workers in Nigeria. Yeah. Um, we will definitely need them. Uh, we don't have that. Um, we also need to help um, the healthcare professionals understand um, um, the, the patient's rights and, and to provide health care. And, and when they take that oath, is to save people's lives. So, so please, um, th these are the things that are most important uh, in a country where life means nothing. And that's why always, my slogan has always been life is number one, because with everything that we have, if none of us are here, then it's all worthless. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, the two key things from there, those social workers, uh, about three weeks ago, we actually had a session on that, why right. we definitely need to amplify social workers and then sacrifices, which is key, because everybody talks about stuff. But we say, we all, you know, the whole point of this is we talk about stuff in the pub and it dies, but we want to keep the, the, the hope alive here. So that sacrifice aligns with what you're saying. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'll go to Prof now, uh, because I know, Monica, you've already highlighted stuff. I'll go to Prof and then we can do uh, go to... Um, uh, me and a few other people here. Everybody who has a chance just to say that one minute. So, uh, Prof. I just want to, I just want to say, let's just keep, uh, I'm, I'm glad to, to see this platform. Let's keep supporting each other. Our way, the African way, is to work together. It's just that simple. If we to, don't try it? to work together, it's not going to pan out for us. If Thank we you. can find ways to connect with, with each other, then we are going to excel. Thank so, you. So, so you're talking about collaboration there, effective collaboration. Yeah. Yep. Thanks a lot. Hey, let's go back to uh, Jide. Jide, just your own best practice in terms of, hey, look, uh, learning and doing gap. So what, what we're not learning and uh, what we're not doing, but what are the best practices from your point of view that you think would enhance the, our education and health sector? Um, well, I, I think, to be honest, I just want to recognize the many contributions of many who spoke. And yeah. um, I want to echo Omololu as well. Thank you so much for your insight. I think that, you know, uh, we also need to um, look at what people can do back home. Um, this is not a dictatorship, it's a partnership. Um, so I think that lessons should be learned from that. So my own take home is working together and making things better for the country and our citizens. I particularly uh, want to be more uh, vested in patient voices. I think that people should have more say in what happens to them. Great stuff. Thanks a lot, Jide. I mean, I'm taking from what you said, you know, that uh, uh, home participation. And obviously, as you can see, Doc is already doing that. So that's great. We just need that to be amplified. Uh, Mr. Obiaru, are you there in terms of hey, just giving us best practice uh, from a learning and doing yeah. gap? How can we close that no, gap? And obviously, uh, from an education and health point of view. Yes, I'm here. Um, I think what we can do, we can benchmark a minimum practice, minimum standard, sorry. Benchmark a minimum standard and build from. Because um, where there are no stats or where there are irregular standards, that's where I was actually going to when I talked about accountability. Right. When a teacher um, doesn't do what she ought to do, she should be accountable to something. When a medical practitioner um, makes a mistake with someone's life, they should be accountable. But let there be a minimum benchmark, then we can build it from it. If we can enforce a minimum benchmark so that at least there's a standard they can attain to and then we build it from it. That could also help. Awesome. Is it okay if I follow you up on a, uh, that's a minimum benchmark? Because it sounds like you have an idea about that and you know, we can find ways to amplify that. That could be a cry, you know, for, for, for people on, in terms of orientation. Okay, I can, can say this. Minimum um, benchmark, then we can know what for, inside. for instance, you know, no, 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 I'll, I'll about, follow you um, up on that. A lot of private up. schools, but there are still government schools. I think I'll take you up offline with that one. I'm just saying, is it okay? If I... okay. okay, that's fine, that's fine, yeah. that's fine. Okay, cool. Pass off to Tunde now. Uh, Mr. Tunde, if you, if you were there and you've been listening, right, uh, I know I'm catching you off guard. In terms of best practices, do, do you have uh, one or two that you can share with us? Uh, well, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, but you've said it all. Uh, we all have experiences. I'm involved with, uh, with my own old school association as well. And uh, I know what interaction we get back from when we try to intervene and do some few things. But I would say effective collaboration, as I've been mentioned, right. uh, is still the way to go. We have just have to come together. We won't give up on Nigeria. And uh, that's why I just like the, the attitude uh, with the conference of everybody involved this evening. We won't give up. We won't rely on representing on the government. We'll continue with our, our 
you know, the collaboration and the, uh, the effectiveness of how we coming together and continually uh, do things on our own, on the private side. And then hopefully the government will come to their senses. I'm sure they will come to us at some point. Yeah, we just have to continue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll go to us now, but also uh, just to give you a heads up, uh, Tunde is a politician, and I know we'll align on that uh, later on in terms of how we can package these things together. Um, also, in terms of uh, your own exposure now, best practices that you think can enhance us, please, uh, and then we can uh, wrap it up with uh, probably Bola uh, and Mrs. Amadi, and then we can call it a day. All right, thanks, guys. So for me, best practice from what I've seen in Nigeria and across everywhere else across the world is actually, I, I know we won't like it, it's actually partnerships with government. Um, I keep on saying it, we can't crowdfund our way out of bad governance, out of bad healthcare systems. It's even Bill Gates cannot. And Bill Gates only really made progress when he partnered with the government. And when I made my first comment, I said there are really only two ways that, you know, initiative like this can work. If you, if you are a large enough collective that you have the funding and you can go it alone without government, or you need to partner with government. What, what I, I seem to have picked up from this conversation is that everyone is doing amazing stuff, but like Solomon said, we seem to be you know, doing amazing stuff in isolated silos. Um, something else I've seen elsewhere, um, I think it was in uh, Canada, I think, um, there was, is actually like a collective of diaspora initiatives that come together as an umbrella body. So you have people under this umbrella who are doing healthcare initiatives, social work, um, education, um, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. But they are all under one umbrella that forms such a large body that they can actually start interfacing with the government and with communities. Um, so the analogy I gave in my post was, we seem to be using this shotgun effect that scatters the pellets across um, if we are able to collaborate what you see that we're, we're more like snipers and we have this laser laser focus on all the initiatives we need to do and, and it will actually be more impactful and in closing i will just say that we do have social workers in nigeria and we actually have an association um, there and the, we have a ministry of women affairs and social development so if we're looking to build social workers, it might be worth looking to interface with either the association or with the Ministry of Women Affairs and Social Development. I said, uh, sorry about that. I said, thanks a lot. If there's anybody that needs to follow up on that, especially on the social uh, workers point of view, uh, I know um, it's something that might be of interest to, to, to we, uh, and uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, Chike Meme, if you're there, um, could you just give us a best practice? I know you've been on for a while. Yes, thanks a lot. I really appreciate what's going on. Awesome. Uh, I, I just want to stand behind the comments made by the speaker, I think Aneni. Right. Uh, I think you summed it up well. I appreciate your own initiative. I think collaboration starts with um, finding out, are there other voices like yours? Come together under one powerful umbrella. And like he said, um, even Bill Gates can't do it alone. But we have to find a way I'm in Nigeria at the moment with lots of shuttles to London. Find a way to create a network to work with politicians. Uh, I think Omolulu or somebody said it's, it's not totally as bad. I think what is lacking is um, informed intervention that is seen to be impartial. Uh, because we've seen lots of diasporans also come to Nigeria and join this bandwagon of what we call politicians. Yeah. So when we a civilized, a civil society that's making sense, I think that's the easiest way to intervene. And, and I see you laboring with that point a lot. And I want to encourage you to keep at it, uh, laboring with what can we do? What can we do? Let's stop the complaining. We know all the problems. We just have to now come together under the umbrella. I'm kidding to you right away. Thanks a lot, buddy. Awesome. Thank you. That's exactly what it is. And uh, you hit the nail on the head. We don't really want to dwell on arguing and shouting about stuff. It's the how, because uh, action is needed on a different level. Um, so, me, if you can, from your point of view, best practice, how do we unlock it? And then we can really just, uh, just drive this home. Yes, I think that we should basically go back to basics. We should... Right. Uh, regarding the healthcare system, try to do community outreaches. Um, my idea would be to like, uh, someone had said we should find a voice that, that's like yours, band together and start a, a model 
of creating little community centers with uh, mini pharmacies and then staff them with, you know, maybe like a doctor to nurses or something or midwives and have them basically teach people how to prevent stuff that's happening to them instead of waiting for it to, you know, get so bad that they would need urgent medical care. If you teach people how to uh, prevent a lot of things that we see, how to take care of themselves from the, from, from the beginning, it's not going to get that bad and the healthcare system will not be that uh, inundated with all these cases. And also those same people that they trust that are in the communities can also do a weekly or bi-weekly sort of uh, training, CPR, uh, you know, uh, little things that we can do if we say someone has running in stomach or something, you don't have to rush to the hospital or whatever. Yeah. I believe that if we go to the community level and build on that, the government will catch up. Because at this point, I don't think the government is going to be on board. Like Omolulu said, you need to start something. They need to see something going on and they will co-opt into that idea. So I think we need to take it back to the communities and build from there. Thank you. So it's not, um, okay, David, if you don't mind, do you want to go ahead in terms of... Well, um, everybody said it all. Um, I'm so happy that um, Omolulu is here. Um, she is our grassroots. Um, she's a strong woman. I thank you very much for your time. Um, Sandra, all your efforts are not gone unnoted. Um, all I can say is, can we all just keep being together, growing in unity, growing in strength? In strength, we will win. Thank you very much. All right. Um, guys, this, this is normally one hour, but we stretched it today because we, we started late and obviously education being a key factor, a key subject for, for the country. Um, we would like to continue on education and health sector because we didn't talk <laughs> on the diasporic resources and we didn't talk about creating medical awareness, which I think the key value is, is, is hidden in there. This is why we have the doctors and the professors to say, okay, how can we actually create that awareness because you create a thing that you effect change. Um, and then we can move next week again into unlocking those values between education and health. I can only thank you guys for jumping in and say, hey, look, we will definitely sit on the topic and we've been pushing and people have been aligning and collaborating and actually started doing stuff, right? The onus is on us to decide if we want to do it, right? So I can only say thank you and um, we're, we're out of time again, um, but yeah, please. Yeah, and uh, thank you very much for your time. I hope everyone had a great time. Yeah, thanks for your contributions. Cheers.